Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us at another session of our Ask Greenwich con um, Conversations, where myself and Cabinet members are answering your questions from across Greenwich. My name is Councillor Danny Thorpe, I'm the leader of the Royal Borough of Greenwich, and I'll be hosting today's session. First of all, can I make apologies for Councillor Sisway James, who's our Cabinet Member for Transport. Sadly, he's not able to be here with us today because he's just become a father. Uh, so he's had a baby. So we're sending uh, many congratulations uh, to him uh, and we hope uh, that he will be uh, joining us back uh, very soon. So I'll now introduce, hand over to introduce our two cabinet members who joined me today. Let's start with Councillor Sarah Merrill. Sarah, sorry, you're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. First, first mistake. Um, I beg your pardon. So um, I'm the cabinet member for planning and regeneration. Thanks. And Anthony? Thanks, Danny. Um, so my name is Anthony. I'm the cabinet member for housing. Thank you very much. Great. And you can stay uh, involved in the session, whether or not you've submitted a question. Uh, this is going out live on Facebook. And you can also use the hashtag Ask Greenwich and we'll keep uh, an eye on those and see what's coming in so that we can make it uh, a more live conversation. Um, so I'm going to start with some questions around housing. Um, Anthony, uh, and I'll be sending these your way. Um, I've got a question here um, from uh, someone, uh, Catherine actually, uh, who's written to ask if there are going to be any opportunities uh, for housing uh, for staff in the NHS. Uh, and I guess maybe, you know, how do we support key workers to gain access to housing for them? Thanks for, the, thanks for the question, Catherine. Um, it's fair to say we want to thank all of our key workers for all the work that they do during this time. We know how difficult it's been for some of them. Um, and in terms of housing, you know, we're seeing the need for key worker housing. Um, in Greenwich, we're investing in a lot of opportunities um, for key worker housing. And our housing allocation policy seeks to allocate certain housing for key workers. Uh, we've also got a partnership with Meridian Homestar, which is a private rented accommodation which is affordable offer we have partnered with, um, with, with meridian homes so that's kind of the avenue we're doing to incorporate um, key work housing but we're also working with other partners to make sure we're delivering and building new um homes for people who can who can go into those kind of things that are more suited for key workers because we, at the end of the day we don't want them in the borough we don't want them having to travel out travel in from other areas because we understand how much of that, how much of a pressure that is on them. Um, so, you know, we're, we're focused on it. We're looking at how we continue to develop new homes. Um, you know, it's fair to say that there's always going to be more of a need and we are working on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And obviously just to say a huge uh, thank you to Catherine and all of our uh, key workers who continue to play such a uh, vital role for all of us during uh, COVID. So thank you. Uh, Catherine. Um, now we've got another question here, Anthony, from uh, Joanne, who's asking um, about uh, one of our registered providers, Optivo. Um, basically, she's quite concerned uh, that residents, um, she says, are being left uh, waiting without hot water and heating. Uh, and actually, I guess, uh, and more broadly, number one, uh, how are we able to hold registered providers and housing associations to account? Um, and also, um, in, in other terms, um, I, I will pick up this bit of the question, which is about how we're supporting residents um, in these unprecedented times. So, Anthony, do you want to do an Optivo? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I would first say, um, you know, we want to make sure that our residents aren't experiencing such situations. Um, um, Optivo don't have any properties within the borough, but on a wider note, in terms of social landlords, we regularly meet with our social landlord partners to kind of understand the challenges that they're facing. And also one of the things we're gonna be doing with them is speaking about some of the experiences that our resident, residents go through. Um, so we would never um, condone or see it acceptable that anyone would be in that kind of situation. But what we do say is use us to kind of get in contact with them. Um, if, you haven't if, if you haven't managed to you know, have that chat with them themselves, then we can look into it for you because we do meet with them regularly and we do kind of have those conversations with them. So 
do get in touch. Um, I'm sure at, at the bottom of the um, chat screen, my email will be dropped in there or the council's email will be dropped in there where, we, where you can raise something if it's if you're, you are in a situation where you have a repair and it's just not been dealt with, um, you know, because we, we, we don't want people to be kind of experiencing such difficulties and we are in a position where we can kind of have those conversations directly with your social landlord of which there are many in the borough. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, now moving um, on to a question, um, sorry, I'll just pick up on the second point of that, which is about how we're supporting families during the pandemic. Um, obviously, COVID has been a massive challenge for people, whether it's food, whether you're shielding, uh, whether you know, you're potentially facing the threat of eviction from a landlord. Um, and our community hub uh, has been set up in order to provide uh, food, advice, uh, and really a way into uh, key services for people. So uh, the community hub is, is up and running. I want to thank everyone who's been part of that uh, and we can provide details uh, of how to get involved there. We've also been, as people may know, feeding children over the uh, half term and we're just currently working on plans uh, to continue that throughout Christmas, uh, as well as supporting uh, vulnerable families, particularly with payments for um, fuel. We know that winter fuel uh, issues can be a real uh, a real challenge for many people experiencing poverty. So we shall have a, a whole kind of uh, scheme coming out, if you can call it that, to basically show people what additional support we're providing um, during uh, the next uh, bit of winter, uh, moving into spring. Um, and we'll have that uh, up and running uh, as soon as possible. So watch this space uh, there. Um, now, Anthony, um, obviously the question here from Susan, uh, it basically says the Royal Borough of Greenwich has a serious housing problem. What is being done to address this uh, across the borough? Thank you very much, Danny, and thank, thank you, Susan, for your question. Um, it's fair to say we have a housing crisis, um, not just in Greenwich, but a whole, a whole, a whole, a whole, a whole across the whole country. Um, and, you know, it is a real challenge. Currently, we have um, 22,000 homes in the Royal Borough of Greenwich that we manage, but not until two years ago could the council actually borrow money to kind of build more homes. Um, so now we've committed to building 750 homes, and that's currently going through the planning process. Um, and we're starting to get those new council homes approved. Um, so we are focused on building up, but you know that's not always going to be enough. Um, as you can imagine, we have quite a, a lengthy waiting list and, and several people who need housing in the borough. So what we're also doing is striking relationships with people. I spoke earlier about Meridian Homestar and we're using that to deliver housing. We're also working in partnerships with housing associations to make sure that we can continue building affordable housing in the borough. Um, it's a journey. And I think, you know, one thing that we're kind of focused on is where possible, making sure that we can bring the right tools together to deliver homes for people that need it in the borough. Um, and we are, we, are, we are focused on that. And, you know, uh, as, someone who, as someone who still lives at home, you know, you can kind of see where I am in, in the background. You know, that's something I'm focused on. And I kind of understand that experience of um, needing housing, especially one that is affordable. So we're going to move now into Sarah's world, uh, which is obviously working uh, to provide homes uh, as well. Uh, and we've got a question here from Jackie, Sarah, uh, and I guess we could probably have a seminar uh, and uh, many discussions on this one, which is how is planning commission decided in terms of location, homes or commercial use? Okay, thank you. Um, so, so the thing is, Jackie, I, I don't know if there's something specific that you're asking about in a particular area. Um, and of course, I can't ask you that at the moment. So um, I, I can give you a broad answer. And if there's something more specific, I guess you can um, you can go online and, and ask again. So there's there's a various layers of policy framework set out under which planning is determined. So we have the national policy framework, which is laid down by government. We have the regional one, which is the London, a thing called the London plan in our case. And then Greenwich has its own local plan. And then within that, we also have um, much more localized plans, which we call supplementary planning documents, such as for Charlton, such as for Woolwich. 
And under these, we as a borough determine what sort of development might be suitable. And we do this in consultation with the communities, what sort of development might be suitable for each area. So on the peninsula, which was a concrete jungle of docks, it was long decided, you know, 20 odd years ago, that that would be developed for um, housing, mostly housing, along with some employment base, and that um, we could allow some taller buildings there. On Charlton Riverside, we've liaised with the community and it's much more medium rise, it's much more, it, it's a different sort of development we're, we're allowing. We always try to um, encourage and develop as much green space, parks, biodiversity. We're very strong on protecting trees these days. And then under this level, there are also the material planning considerations, which come into each individual development. And we're very robust about those as well. There is a certain amount that's allowed under government legislation of permitted development. Um, and there is a government white paper, the consultation at the moment, which we have um, robustly responded to. And in our view, we think threatens our local democracy in terms of planning and does allow more permitted development and redesignation of certain areas, etc. Um, but we are very, um, I would say, fairly tough in Greenwich in what we allow and what we refuse and what we stand up to. It's not always down to us though. Um, any developer, a, a, any individual planning application or any big development can of course appeal either direct to the planning inspectorate or to the Greater London Assembly and then to the government afterwards. Sometimes we win and sometimes we get turned over. I feel that there's probably something specific that you're asking about and I'd be more than happy to answer that. But as I don't know, I could only give you that broad answer. Is that fair enough? Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. And obviously just to say, there's a lot of changes uh, being proposed to the planning system and Sarah, uh, alongside all other councillors in Greenwich are fighting hard against them because actually uh, the government proposals would actually take power away from communities and and we absolutely don't want that to happen and um, recognize that you know planning can be a very difficult process uh, but having it all decided in Whitehall uh, with no you know reference to local area local concerns will be uh, a massive massive problem um, just to say I can see some of the comments coming through in the chat box so thanks for those uh, in particular Jade and Ellie thank you for your comments it's, um, they're quite specific and I don't really want to get into your personal issues uh, online for breaching your confidence. So if the comms team could just make sure that we plug in uh, an email address to pick up with Jade and Ellie, uh, their cases afterwards, uh, we can pass them over to Anthony to get looked into. Um, so please do keep those coming, but I'll, I'll kind of keep it. Um, I, I won't go into personal details, uh, just to protect you really. Um, okay. Um, there's another question here, Sarah, from Martin. Uh, and Martin says, um, basically, are uh, regeneration plans for the borough uh, going ahead as usual, uh, or have they been delayed because of COVID? So thanks, Martin. So they are going ahead as usual. And I, again, I don't know where you live, so I don't know where specifically you'd like to talk about. So I'm, I'll give you, I can answer it in terms of a, a, a quick whiz around the borough telling you what we are doing. Um, in only in a small way would I say our regeneration plans have been impacted by the pandemic, and I'll come back to that. So um, in Woolwich, we, um, we're developing an, a, a, an amazing new leisure centre. Um, we also have the High Street Fund, so we're, gonna, we're going to work with the community to, um, to improve a lot of the shop fronts along the High Street. Um, and of course, we continue to fight big developments such as the proposal for the tower that we rejected in the middle of um, in the middle of, middle of Woolwich. Don't worry, Danny. Don't look horrific. I'm not going to go into this detail around the whole 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 borough. Don't look so horrified. Yeah. Um, in Plumstead, we have what's called the Good Growth Fund. We want a bid there to get money again to to improve um, frontages, etc. And that's the one area really where we have been held back a bit by the pandemic. 
because we obviously have to consult and we have to so we have to consult with the shop owners and we also have to survey the buildings and that's been really difficult in the pandemic you can't go along and survey buildings while under the COVID restrictions. So there's been a bit of a delay on public engagement and taking that one forward. Um, I won't go into Charlton Riverside, we have enormous plans there. Um, in, um, similarly in Thamesmead, we have identified a whole opportunity area which we're working on. In Eltham, we in Kibbrook, we're developing a community space which is going to have a whole health a uh, new health hub in there with a new doctor's surgery, a pharmacy, and some community uh, use space as well. Um, in Greenwich, we're working hard to make sure that the frontage along the creek, creek side is maintained, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I could go on. Um, in, in, also, in terms of helping businesses through the pandemic. We've um, been implementing the government's grant scheme to businesses. We've all uh, um, we've been um, allocating the business rate relief, and we've also gone a step further, and we've given rent concessions to a number of businesses across the borough. So, I you will know about. So we and, and, and I could go on. Sorry, Danny. I'm no, sorry. No, 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 no. 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 Honestly, question, but I'm happy to answer anything specific. I think my facial expressions there, Sarah, were more of astonishment that considering all of the work that had gone in from the council and the community to rejecting the tower outside Tesco's, mm -hmm. uh, people think that, well, the applicant clearly thinks that, you know, taking five stories off uh, is going to resolve things. And, you know, I would just say, uh, I guess, to people, if they're watching, uh, you know, I think we all run a really good campaign there to make clear that number one, that piece of land is not acceptable for development. I think we've won that, uh, again, we won that argument at the public inquiry, uh, and I have every confidence that we would win it again. Um, and, you know, whilst, of course, we're absolutely, um, you know, balancing the need, and I can see comments from uh, Marnie, I think, on the Facebook chat here, saying, you know, that uh, we don't help anyone, and, and actually, Marnie, although I'm really sorry that you haven't perhaps been helped, like, we do help you know, people, and I've met people, we've handed over keys, you know, and, you know, but fundamentally, we can't just, you know, let every single bit of land in the borough, which is unsuitable to, for development, uh, become uh, housing. And the most frustrating thing uh, about that particular development was that there was no plans for social housing uh, at all within that tower. Uh, and clearly, you know, any uh, proposals which are coming forward uh, in that regard uh, will be assessed against how we can make sure that we're helping to meet the housing need in our borough, which is uh, growing uh, constantly uh, all the time. Um, so we look forward to another uh, community campaign uh, with, the, with, with partners and, and the council. And, and, and Danny, can I just also remind everyone that we were of course backed by Sadiq Khan on that, and um, it ultimately was appealed to the Secretary of State, but um, even the government backed us on that one. And Anthony, obviously that is in your ward. Um, what would you, I mean, you were quite involved in sort of the campaign and working with residents. Do you think that people would think that the new proposals are any better? Um, I haven't seen any new proposals yet um, as, as a ward councillor. Um, I guess what I would say is that, you know, um, I think, you know, in, in that area, I think the way Woolwich is with the Tesco, it's quite open um, and, and, you know, we would want it to remain like that. Okay, right, well, let's move on to uh, some other questions now. Um, so we've got a question here from Georgina uh, and Geraint Thomas, um, and their question relates to uh, an absolutely horrendous uh, accident that happened in Broadwalk uh, earlier on this year, um, where an 11-year-old boy was critically injured. Um, so can I just say, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, the question. Uh, obviously, uh, in all my time, uh, as a councillor, incidents like this are extremely rare. And of course, every time something like that happens, deeply, deeply distressing and traumatic uh, for all involved. Uh, we know that there's been a joint site visit uh, to the location uh, with the police. Uh, and obviously, uh, we need to make sure that we're working with the police to fully look at all of the traffic issues and see whether or not there was any contributory factors uh, which could have prevented this awful accident. And we've also been 
awaiting uh, the, the coroner's inquest, uh, which will take probably about a year. Um, but obviously complex investigations can take uh, a little bit longer. So uh, on behalf of all of us at the council, can I just say, uh, send our condolences to everyone in that community which was affected uh, by that tragedy. Um, and I know that we'll be working uh, with you and your ward councillors uh, every step of the way um, to see what improvements uh, can uh, be made and, and the evidence behind what improvements would need to be done uh, so that we can make sure that any changes uh, are, are the right ones uh, in order to protect people. Okay, now we're going to move into some questions about transport now, and thank you to everyone who sent in your transport questions. Uh, transport is really uh, the hot topic uh, of, uh, of the moment, really, with all of the COVID uh, restrictions that are in place. Um, as Sisway uh, isn't here, um, I will be um, responding uh, to those questions. So. It's going to be a lot of me talking uh, for the next few minutes, uh, I'm afraid. Um, and the first thing I want to say is obviously change is always difficult and no change is ever easy and all of us find change um, challenging. That said, given uh, where we are in the pandemic, given everything that unfolded with COVID, the need to uh, actually ensure uh, social distancing on public transport, we've never faced a greater challenge. Uh, than we actually have had uh, from, uh, from this pandemic. Uh, so whilst we absolutely may not have got everything right, uh, it's not for the want of trying, uh, and clearly uh, we're gonna continue uh, with the schemes that we have uh, and encourage everyone to come into the consultation and make their views known so that when we do full evaluations about whether things remain, change or stay the same, we have the biggest evidence base there possible. Uh, so I've got a question, first of all, from Lee, um, and Lee's asking uh, about changes and, and says that uh, most Greenwich residents don't own a car, but that's not his uh, experience. Well, uh, thanks for your question, Lee. Actually, we know uh, that in 2018, which is the last data that we had, there were about 78,000 cars which were registered uh, in Royal Greenwich. Now, we have just under 290,000 residents overall. So actually that tells us that probably about 27% of the borough population does own a car. So obviously that's three people who don't own a car for everyone who does. Uh, now that means you know, that, that we, obviously we have to make sure you know, that we are balancing uh, all of the pre competing pressures uh, and priorities uh, that happen. And clearly in some parts of the borough, car ownership is gonna be higher than other areas. And we, you know, equally in some parts of the borough, access to pop, uh, decent public transport uh, is not as easy as it is in other parts. So there's a whole range of issues there in, in the mix, really, that basically, um, I think, mean that in the end, you know, we can't just have a system which is uh, relying on cars or buses or trains or the DLR. We need to have a whole transport strategy which provides good options for everyone. And that means that we do have to prioritise public transport, uh, particularly uh, public transport in those mass transit areas. So thank you for your question. Uh, a question here from Martin uh, and Jan Hyde, who are asking about the work that's happening on Shooters Hill Road around the Lido. Now, um, unfortunately, um, some of the uh, crossings that were due to be installed for pedestrians uh, have been ordered uh, but the manufacturers have been delayed because of COVID. And, you know, I know that that's a, a phrase people may think, oh, that's an excuse. Well, it's really not. You know, we're all having anyone uh, who has an organisation, employees are having people who happen to self-isolate, people who may have it, people are caught up in it. You know, people, there is a lot of disruption there. Um, so we can apologise for that frustrating delay. Um, but we are getting some good feedback on that uh, cycle way. Uh, and certainly the reason that the Shooters Hill uh, one went in in the first place uh, was based on, you know, people saying that they really wanted it in terms of demand. So uh, I guess, you know, ultimately um, some disruption, apologies for that, but please uh, bear with us. Uh, we've got uh, some uh, comments, many comments, in fact, around uh, what's happening on Shorten to Woolwich uh, stretch, uh, and in particular, um, concerns around uh, length of journey times 
Um, and I want to apologise again to people for that. Uh, we are working with TfL in particular to review uh, that particular scheme. That is one uh, where we've actually where the capacity has reduced on the road uh, in order to facilitate that. Um, and we just need to absolutely make sure, um, you know, kind of that everyone can get through. Uh, we're not trying to do anything uh, there that that uh, that will cause additional problems. Um, this is part of our cycleway for extent, extension route, um, and clearly we've had to move ahead with that uh, in super quick time. So we just need to um, absolutely um, ensure that that's happened. Uh, question from Amy uh, here in relation to the road closures around Prunes Hill, Hydeville, uh, Point Hill. Now, um, just to say really that even before COVID, uh, there was a lot of work happening with the council, with residents, in uh, what's called the Hills and Vows scheme um, to address the issues that they were facing. And it's worth pointing out that, you know, there are many areas in the borough, not just Hills and Vows, you know, other places uh, that are actually residential roads. They're not roads that are built for juggernauts and large Amazon lorries and uh, long trails of commuters. And unfortunately, uh, in the last 10 years, with the invention of Waze and, you know, the different apps uh, that basically are designed to make everyone's lives easier by moving through, that's had really adverse reaction. Uh, and what we've seen in London in a 10 year period is a 72% increase of cars on London's residential streets and a reduction in traffic on main roads. Now that can't be right. And wh whatever way you cut that cake, we have to be honest, you know, that neighbourhoods are for communities and for people. And, and obviously, uh, you know, we are also seeing uh, massive uh, challenges in relation to that. Now, we know that there's a significant reduction in use of public transport that is increasing. Um, road capacity is currently at about 90% um, and traffic is unpredictable. But what we are seeing is much greater pressure in the morning uh, and really a real reduction in that sort of inter-peak time. Um, so, you know, we are really asking people not to be driving kids to school, you know, where they can help it. That's why we're trying to make school streets uh, spread out across the borough to make those things safer, because actually every car that's moving unnecessarily in the morning uh, is just adding uh, to the pressure. So, you know, I know these things have mixed views um, and we need to continue uh, with the work so that when we do have a full evaluation, uh, we understand, uh, you know, based on data, what's actually happening. I've been down to this uh, to the site with the local ward councillors. Uh, we've met with residents on site, so you know we've seen these uh, issues firsthand. Uh, but we do need, I'm afraid, to work collectively together to face up to this challenge. And just saying no is not going to work, and we're all going to have to make that in order uh, to to move. Uh, move forward. Uh, now, there's just another couple that I want to bring up. I think these are all sort of fairly uh, related. Um, I've got one here from David Webster around the buses uh, and the bus lanes, which I've uh, responded to. Um, the, the mayor is obviously working very closely with uh, boroughs to manage this. Uh, we are doing our absolute best. Um, and if there's further things that you think we should consider, uh, please do. Uh, let us know. Now, I'm just going to have a small uh, break and just check some comments because uh, there's a lot of uh, information uh, there. So um, let's go through and just see what people are saying. Um, okay, we've got uh, Will says here uh, the buses still rely on roads which are gridlocked. Uh, actually, Will, that is, um, you know, that's, that's one observation. It's not the case all across the borough. Um, and certainly I'm spending a lot of time uh, on buses and not every road uh, is, is gridlocked. Um, we do, and obviously, unfortunately, in Greenwich, we had uh, the combination of issues which affected uh, traffic for a number of weeks uh, on the lower uh, road. Um, we've also uh, got here, uh, the cycle lanes are wheelchair friendly from Connor. Um, thanks, Connor. I know that we're looking into that um, and those have uh, gone on there. And Kai Marie says, I'm kind of drowning on a bit with roads now. So thank you for that positive feedback, uh, Kai Marie. But obviously it is uh, an issue that a lot of people uh, have written in about. 
Um, there's just a final uh, question here um, around uh, Creek Road and what's happening uh, there. Uh, that is um, part of our uh, work, um, which is also linked to the cycle, cycle routes. Um, I'm afraid, uh, Elizabeth, uh, with funding uh, being diverted, uh, we don't yet have uh, the funding uh, in place uh, from that. Um, but we're hoping uh, to resume those uh, works in 2021. So that's all for me, uh, really, on transport. Um, so uh, I've not seen any other questions uh, coming through, um, and I hope uh, that that information has been useful. Um, Anthony and Sarah, do you have any uh, final comments, thoughts that you'd like to share before we close? Yeah, um, uh, yeah. I, I would just say, you know, um, obviously we are gearing up for um, Christmas, um, and you know, I'll just make the point, you know, um, in this time we know that people can be much more um, vulnerable because of housing. Um, we've just managed to secure some funding in terms of helping people who are at risk of rust sleeping. Um, so one of the key things we're going to be trying to do is make sure that we get people into um, temporary accommodation that may be put at risk of um, rough sleeping and homelessness during, um, during Christmas time. So if you are experiencing that or you know anyone, please do get in touch with us. Um, I'm sure the council will leave the plug there in the, in the chat box about how you could start doing this. Thank you. And, and Sarah, I've had a, a late question in from Nigel Dickey, who's uh, talked about two things. Uh, one is the um, congratulations on uh, winning uh, the future Woolwich High Street scheme, uh, which he says is good news for Greenwich. So I wondered if we may say something about that. Uh, and he's also asked about when we can expect to see uh, the new Woolwich master plan document. Um, Thank you. So, um, and th thanks for the comments about the high about the high street fund. Um, and we are going to do quite a lot of public engagement about that, by the way. And we are going to use an empty shop in the um, in the street, which will be a sort of what we're calling a community front room, and it will be a place for people to come and learn about the history and the heritage of Woolwich, as well as make comments and contribute. So, thanks for that. Um, what was the second part, Danny? About the Woolwich Master Plan. Oh yeah, we're, we're developing that at the moment. Um, we have a lot of these going on all the time and processes, so I can never quite remember the exact time scales when I'm asked off the top of my head, but I'm quite happy if he wants to email me to get back to him. Um, the process is, is ongoing. I can up, update him on time scales of that. And can I say just one last thing, Danny? Um, the, the question I was asked about regeneration was um, was very broad. It was, ha has, you know, have things been held up because of COVID? And I answered the issue about dealing with um, improving shop fronts in Plumstead, etc. cetera. Um, and then I sort of sprinkled around with a couple of other things we've got going on because they are massive, like the one in Woolwich and the Leisure Centre. They are, they are, massive in terms of um, what they will bring to the borough and then I also just wanted to add that um, the conversation out there in in terms of the climate emergency we're facing and also the impact on jobs and the economy that Covid has had is about driving this green new economy and um, I've been working with both Anthony and of course the leader on developing um, a kind of a green new deal for Greenwich really we are concentrating on trying to decarbonize our own buildings um, our own housing stock and then over and beyond that and to ensure all new builds are as carbon neutral as they can be and there will be a lot of work being done in retrofitting some of these buildings and we do have plans to develop apprenticeship schemes and to try and bring green manufacturing, such as um, up photovoltaic cells, et cetera, as well as heat source pumps, the manufacturing of that into the borough. And that's all part of a big plan that we are all working really hard on. And that doesn't come out because nobody knows to ask that, but we are doing that. Thank you, Danny. Thanks, Sarah. And just a couple uh, of comments I'll pick up on, Millie. So, um, and thanks to everyone else who's tuning uh, tuning in. I've just been notified that Councillor Denise Highland has joined. So, uh, hello, Denise. good afternoon, Denise, and 
no questions from you. <laughs> uh, now, um, all I would say here is, uh, Sally, thanks for your question. Uh, Sally says why there are no truly affordable homes in the new flats that are being built. Uh, and actually, Sally, that is, uh, I'm afraid, a misconception and it isn't true. You know, so uh, I've been down to the peninsula, uh, you know, where actually we've got a load of new LNQ homes there uh, on the riverfront. And, and actually, if you've, um, the good thing is that actually, you know, we don't, we want buildings that, that look absolutely brilliant. We want, you know, decent, uh, high quality council housing. Uh, so um, just from a perception point of view, people may think, oh, you know, more river, more housing by the river. Uh, but in there, the fact that we've got social housing alongside private housing and people can't tell the difference, uh, I think is a really good thing. Uh, actually, Anthony and myself were at planning board uh, last week. Uh, we've just had approval for 117 new council homes uh, on the old Thomas Tallis site, uh, which is obviously hugely uh, significant and we've got planning applications coming forward now uh, for uh, sites on uh, the Brooks and other places uh, uh, in and around Greenwich uh, which will deliver uh, more uh, social housing um, and, and it's really uh, uh, housing I can't tell you honestly how hard it is to get a house built uh, a council house built and it has taken years and years of hard graft and you know I would really appreciate the people that are in the comments box here kind of sharing their views you know coming along uh, to a planning committee and tell and sharing your views about why you need council housing because all too often you get people turning up who want to say no uh, and people are absolutely entitled to say no uh, but you know what this facebook uh, comment feed is telling me right now is we need more people uh, to say yes uh, mike saying shared ownership is not affordable and I get that, Mike, for some parts, you know, we've tried to do everything we can to bring the rates down. That's why we're building homes for social rent, not just shared ownership, because we want to do those uh, at the lowest uh, possible uh, level. Uh, Candy says reducing car parking uh, isn't the answer. Uh, well, I think we uh, can agree to disagree on that one, uh, Candy, because unfortunately, you know, in new developments now, uh, we are trying to build uh, places uh, that don't have car park car parking spaces because, you know, as I said, we're all going to need uh, to make uh, changes. Um, and Jingolo, I'm very sorry to hear about your case. Again, if you uh, want to put into the chat function there uh, an email address where we can contact you, uh, we will definitely uh, pick that up. Now, uh, the final one I just want to do, there's a question from Keith here. He says, what are you doing to employ more road sweepers? too many people in the office? Uh, well, first of all, Keith, uh, thanks for your question. Um, I know that's potentially an easy thing to throw about. Uh, I have got uh, quite a few people in the office uh, looking after uh, the 500 or so uh, children in our care who we look after. Uh, I've got quite a lot of people working in the public health team who are trying to roll out 10,000 lateral flow tests so that we can all be treated for, uh, tested for COVID. Uh, I've got quite a lot of people here uh, working with schools to support them uh, through this nightmare. So, you know, let's not uh, start attacking the council for the functions that we absolutely all need to run. Uh, obviously, you know, we have massive budget challenges. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Tomorrow, the Chancellor is going to publish his spending review. Uh, we've already been told, I think, as people see in the news, that a public sector pay freeze is the answer. Actually, people in this council and councils up and down this country have worked flat out every day since March the whenever it was when this all started to keep everyone uh, safe in Greenwich and I really hope tomorrow that we get uh, the settlement that we need from the Chancellor to provide decent public services because unless we do Keith there's going to be even less people uh, on the road than there is now uh, sweeping streets because our budgets are being continually uh, continually stretched. Can I add something to that Danny? Yeah. So, because uh, I want to say to people, you can see he's sitting in his office at the moment, and I am actually here in the town hall, not genuinely in front of this part of it, but I am in the town hall. Um, and actually, the leader of the council has been in self-isolating, but, you know, like in, in so socially distancing, I should say. I think just about every single day, other than the occasional day's leave since March the 18th, when um, the, the first lockdown was declared. And I don't think many people realise that, but I... I I don't think anyone makes that point on his behalf, so I want to make that. Um, and um, 
Oh, I forgot the other part. There was something else in the question that I wanted to answer, but it doesn't matter. But I do want to, to oh, well, that, that's right. Yeah, the constraints that we're under. And um, can I just say this about the housing? So we're under a national government housing policy, which we find very difficult to work within. And it relies on public, it relies on private developers um, delivering units, numbers of units um, that are numbers set by the government. And obviously, they they can if they display a particular economic case that they can justify the low number of so-called affordable or genuinely social rent that, that they provide. And that's national policy framework. And we find it very difficult because, like you, we have to see tower blocks go up, big buildings, and we think none of those flats are for us. And all I can say is, uh, really, we, we, we share your concern over that. And it's something we feel in the planning side of it very, very acutely. And um, we, we fight it where we can, but they are numbers that we are targeted to build. Um, and we don't believe that they deliver most of them for um, the people out there on our waiting lists who need it and key workers and nurses and teachers who need you know places to live and these apartments could be six hundred thousand pounds but that's not Greenwich policy and I'm not just trying to make excuses um, I think Anthony and Danny will agree we work very 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 hard kicking back and protecting Greenwich against that as much as we can and trying to deliver as much social rent and affordable rent as we possibly possibly can but you have but you know we only have so much power and it's not absolute okay well thanks so much Sarah, for that and i completely agree with everything you said um anthony thank you for joining us thanks everyone for tuning in uh, we hope it's been a useful session uh, and we look forward to catching up soon thank you